All right, so here we are today. Uh, Eamon is going to be uh, the first speaker this morning. And, you know, it's been fun watching Eamon progress in, in his pursuit of history. You know, I first met him as the, he was the drum major for the historic Fort York uh, Corps of Drums. Uh, he's pursued his academic studies in the UK at the University of Ox Oxford and, and very generous sharing insights and research and, and, and fascinating tidbits that, that he has come up with. So uh, it's great to give Eamon this platform. And without further ado, we'll turn this over to Eamon. And Eamon, you can drive your own slides and I'll step out of the way. So welcome, Eamon. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Chris and uh, Tom, for inviting me to speak. Uh, and, for this, and, to, and I'd like to thank as well the sponsors, as Tom has said, uh, of the symposium. Uh, I'm really excited to be uh, a part of this really excellent, uh, impressive lineup that you've gathered today and also throughout the talks before and after. Um, so, the res so this presentation really stems from research I did a number of years ago uh, for a master's degree. Uh, I'm now working on a PhD on a rather different project on uh, military music. Um, and, uh, but this, this is the, the questions of, of dueling and officers' behavior, uh, interpersonal disputes among officers. These are all things I'd like to uh, return to uh, in future. Uh, and uh, so I'll, I'll give you a taster of what I uncovered a couple years ago uh, through, this, uh, uh, through this presentation today. So thanks so much for, for tuning in. Right, so we'll actually start at the front here again. Uh, the, the conduct of, of British military officers in the early 19th century was governed by seemingly contradictory uh, expectations. Officers were supposed to comport themselves as autonomous, self-respecting gentlemen while simultaneously offering absolute obedience to superiors. They were expected to embody politeness, civility, and self-restraint, but were also required to resolutely repel the slightest aspersions against their character through dueling if necessary. So the historian Arthur Gilbert, in an important article on military law and honor in the 1970s, uh, correctly assessed that army officers uh, in the 18th century were members of an exclusive club with its own distinct values. But martial masculinity, and when I say that I mean how military men comported themselves, uh, also owed much to the social milieu in which most officers were bred. Historians including Katrina Kennedy and Janine Hurl Amon have highlighted the influence of civilian behavioral codes on 18th century soldiers. While officers were well known for drunken carousing and a culture of freewheeling bachelorhood, they were equally keen to cultivate more refined pastimes and pursuits expected of contemporary gentlemen, including dancing, music making, drawing, and reading for leisure. Hegemonic aspects of Georgian elite identity, including politeness uh, and a culture of honor, were embraced by military men and tailored to the demands of army life. In the latter case, that of honor, assuming a much more concentrated imperative form. Gentility and refined manners were considered pre preconditions for martial leadership, enhancing social harmony and discipline within regiments, while an obsession with honor was thought to promote battlefield bravery and forbearance in the face of possible death or hardship. Dueling, a central component of this contemporary culture of honor, was common among army officers, but overindulgence in this custom imperiled military authority and cohesion. Moreover, as we'll discover, the civilian credo of gentlemanly autonomy fomented resentment of soldierly subservience. Okay, so just to outline, uh, in this presentation, I'll begin by considering officers' attitudes to honor and military authority, and then move on to probe the tensions with an officer's sense of themselves as gentlemen soldiers by exploring several interlinked questions. Was it acceptable to challenge superiors to fight a duel? And did martial subordination still apply at mess and at courts martial? The answers remain contested throughout the period due to the clashing demands of honor, manly, independence, and discipline. As we'll see, negotiating these competing behavioral codes could prove as hazardous for military men as any battlefield encounter. Okay, the culture of honor. 
So 18th century officers possessed a well-deserved reputation for sensitivity about personal honor. Quarreling between military men could escalate with astonishing speed over curt correspondence or inebriated mess room slights, culminating in fatal duels and career jeopardizing courts martial. Honor was not simply a matter of private self-esteem, but of public reputation, requiring constant validation in the eyes of peers. A soldier's character, according to, according to an officer uh, uh, of the 89th foot in 1810, quote, should be pure and unsullied. The slightest stain tarnishes it forever. Another officer compared a gentleman's reputation to female chastity. Quote, once gone, it was never to be recovered. This reputational fragility obliged gentlemen to notice in the contemporary parlance, to notice insults uh, that their social inferiors who were not expected to maintain these elite pretensions might more easily ignore without reproach. So honor affronts could take many forms, but typically involved allegations of cowardice or mendacity or some challenge to a gentleman's status or autonomy. Giving the lie, accusing someone of deceit was an especially grave insult, partly because truth-telling was emblematic of chivalry, a resurgent contemporary masculine ideal, but also because dishonesty implied cowardice. As an oft reprinted 18th century periodical proclaimed, quote, one may tell another, another he whores, drinks, blasphemes, and it may pass unresented. But giving the lie, even in jest, is an affront which nothing but blood can expiate. Fibbing to slander enemies or avoid the consequences of telling the truth evinced faint heartedness. No other vice implies a want of courage, according to contemporaries, as much as mendacity. Timidity and dishonesty were closely intertwined. By suggesting a gentleman was not the man of honor he claimed to be, charges of cowardice amounted to giving the lie in another form. A coward in the king's service was an imposter unworthy of his commission. Besides liar and coward, an officer's vocabulary of fighting words included poltroon, rascal, scoundrel, and blackguard, all denoting dishonored, and most also suggesting cowardice or duplicity. Poltroon is basically a, a, a synonym for coward. Reputational affronts could also be physical acts, striking or horsewhipping a gentleman, or even flourishing a cane to threaten a blow, challenged the victim's claim to masculine autonomy and equal consideration as a member of polite society. As odd as it may appear to us today, the act of pulling someone's nose was another severe physical indignity, an especially aggressive means of giving the lie. Captain True of the 41st Foot, whose nose was tweaked by Captain Chambers during an argument in a Montreal mess room in 1810, described the act as, quote, an atrocity rarely equaled. Such physical insults were symbolic gestures within an elite language of honor, perpetrated primarily to inflict reputational rather than bodily harm. These indignities need not actually be inflicted to fulfill their semiotic function. At least two officers were killed in duels prompted by metaphorical nose pullings in which the offenders told their victims to quote, consider their nose tugged without actually bothering to carry out the deed. So the next slide, dispute resolution. So breaches of civility, whether verbal or physical signified disrespect and they undermined an officer's status requiring a suitable counterattack to restore his besmirched reputation. An affronted gentleman was expected to seek a friend or a second to demand his adversary apologize or explain his actions, while the offender also typically appointed his own second to negotiate as an intermediary on his behalf. Often apologies were indeed offered once tempers had cooled, but if not, the parties might exchange pistol shots after which honor was pronounced satisfied and the dispute buried, at least in theory. Through personal combat, the offended party restored his tarnished honor in the eyes of his peers by risking his life in its defense, while the offender proved his absolute willingness to stand behind his words and actions. If the practice of dueling seems 
inexcusably reckless and bloodthirsty to contemporary critics, just as it does to us today. Defenders of this prevailing culture of honor characterize dueling as the guarantor of civility and politeness. The threat of being called to account for indiscretion made men careful to avoid offense, thereby preserving social harmony. Now, homicide was, of course, illegal, and dueling was formally banned under military law. But personal combat under the honor code was customarily tolerated. Participants in duels deemed to have been fairly conducted, uh, whether tried by courts martial or in civilian courts, could typically expect to receive an acquittal or a pardon. For example, Lieutenant Lloyd of the Sixth Foot who mortally wounded Lieutenant Bennett of the same regiment following a dinnertime dispute in Montreal in 1805, was acquitted of murder by a lower Canadian grand jury. Now, it was also possible to resolve affronts to, uh, to, affronts to personal honor through military law, which prohibited, quote, reproachful or provoking speeches, speeches and gestures. This was effectively a ban on insults. As Captain True of the 41st rather obsequiously averred in his courtroom address, on receiving Chambers's insults, quote, my first thoughts were turned to the laws of my country. True pressed charges, informing the court martial, in an apparent attempt to claim some credit for refraining from dueling, uh, that the law offered, quote, the only proper redress for his wounded honor. Another 41st officer, Lieutenant Benoit Bender, hounded by allegations of battlefield cowardice, requested a trial to vindicate his honor and was cleared by court-martial of misbehaving in action, thereby de debunking the aspersions against his character far more effectively than could have been achieved through an exchange of shots. One well-informed commentator and author of an influential 1816 military legal treatise asserted that recourse to martial tribunals to penalize incivility was becoming increasingly favored in the army, but also conceded that dueling remained a widespread mode of redress among officers. So officers were also steeped in, a, in elite culture, uh, emphasizing both masculine autonomy and gentlemanly equality. These were values that potentially threatened military subordination. As Matthew McCormick has shown, the ideal of the independent man, drawing on classical Republican principles of self-mastery, patriotism, and martial valor, was celebrated at, as a paragon of Georgian elite manliness and citizenship. But the military emphasis on hierarchical obedience conflicted with this prevailing ethos of gentlemanly autonomy. Radical author Mary Wollstonecraft pointedly drew parallels between soldiers and women, claiming that both were forced into lives of servility, expected to obey their commanders or their husbands without question. As Katrina Kennedy has shown, subalterns, now that's a term used for ensigns and lieutenants, subalterns, often chafed at their subjection to military hierarchy, decrying their emasculating, quote, want of independence in letters home. The diktats of disagreeable superiors compromised their autonomy. Quote, the pleasure of being one's own master, Lieutenant Coles of the 40th foot lamented, was unattainable in the army, as quote, a more slave-like profession cannot exist. George Wood, an officer in the 82nd foot, rejoiced at becoming his own master again on leaving the service. You'll see the quotation on the bottom of the slide no longer subject to orders, reprimands, or martial law, he compared himself to a caged bird newly set at liberty. Although young men often pursued military careers to achieve status and demonstrate masculine courage, their pursuit of manly independence was not always easily reconciled with the demands of martial subordination. And it's also worth emphasizing at this point that the culture of honor subscribed to by both officers and civilian elites was predicated on a sense of gentlemanly equality. Dueling was explicitly regarded as, as a social leveler, affording satisfaction to wounded honor, in the words of a contemporary, independent of the law's delay of money 
or superiority in rank. As all gentlemen were in theory subject to the honor code, contemporaries believed even the wealthiest and most influential aristocrats could not mistreat humbler counterparts without risking a challenge to fight a duel themselves. Defenders of dueling lauded the practice as, quote, the guarantee of the weak against the strong and the cement of mutual courtesy among gentlemen. Yet the culture of honor's insistence that all elite men could be held accountable for their words and actions through dueling had dangerous implications for military discipline. Were subordinates obliged to submit quietly to indignities from their commanding officers? Or were their superiors equal actors on the stage of honor, liable to a challenge if they offered offense? Okay, so now I've posed that question for you to, to ponder uh, for a moment, and hopefully I'll be able to go some way towards answering it uh, in the next section of this talk. Uh, but it's now your turn to ask me any questions if you have any uh, at this point. So Chris, I'll hand it back over to you for a moment, if, if that's okay. Thanks, Eamon. Um, I'm gonna start um, one from me and, and one from Ryan Clark that are sort of on a similar theme. Sure. Um, so, so Ryan's wondering if there's, if you've found any evidence of dueling amongst um, sort of the so-called other ranks, so NCOs or even lower than that. Um, there are some instances of, of fighting uh, uh, and uh, brawling among, uh, uh, well, uh, fairly co uh, uh, commonly among uh, the other ranks. And there are, if I remember correctly, I have come across one or two cases in which sergeants sort of try to ape this culture of honor by uh, um, uh, challenging or, or fighting uh, a, a duel. And so, it, you know, it should, it should be said that the sensitivity to insults obviously is not the exclusive preserve of gentlemen, but as part of this elite culture, there was an, a special uh, uh, a significance placed on maintaining and defending your reputation from insult. Otherwise, you sink into allegedly social oblivion and no longer uh, uh, gain your, uh, no longer uh, have, have, have claims to status uh, as, as, as a self respecting uh, uh, gentleman. But yes, there are some cases uh, of uh, uh, not only sort of, you know, punch ups between other ranks, but uh, in, a, in a few instances, uh, a, a very few number of instances. Uh, but uh, cases where uh, challenges are sent. And, and, and I think officers in general view this sort of conduct among the other ranks with a bit of disdain because they didn't think that uh, they were of the social class to be participating uh, in the sorts of behavior. Um, and off, and I, if I remember correctly, those cases might be more uh, 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 um, harshly viewed by the, the justice system, both civilian and military, because it was seen, well, they're not, they don't really have this honor code, uh, the other ranks that they need to follow, even if the, the, the soldiers themselves felt that you know, it was something that they had uh, uh, claim to as well, or, or they ought to be able to defend their reputation. Um, I can try to look and, and send a, a uh, in, in my files and send a couple of examples if I'm able to find them. Uh, but they did occur, but were fairly rare. Most of the dueling that you see is among gentlemen or among men with uh, men who had claims to being gentlemen. So there's a bit of tension sometimes where uh, there, there will be people uh, attempting to assert their claims to gentility, but the other officer might uh, uh, or uh, the uh, the other uh, uh, um, uh, uh, antagonist or um, um, a principal, as it was called, the two members uh, uh, involved in the duel, the, pr the other principal of the duel might say, well, I'm you're beneath my my, my notice and therefore I'm, I refuse to duel you. Uh, and sometimes that was actually a very effective way of sort of uh, uh, insulting someone further and then sort of insulating yourself from the challenge to, to duel. Uh, there's a great case in, in 1814 of an officer who's actually, he's basically court-martialed for not dueling because he, he He's pushed in the theater by this commissary who's wearing this kind of fustian jacket, which is seen as rather a uh, 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 low class uh, uh, type of garb. And he's he, this 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 commissary tries to invade his uh, uh, theater box, and the and the and Cal's like, "There's no more room in here." Um, and then some of the other officers say, "Well, just call the sentry. This this character is not really properly a gentleman, uh, and take him out." Uh, uh, and have the sentry sort of remove him. And that sort of thing, physical pushing uh, and getting a sentry to, to, to sort of remove him would be okay if it was not a gentleman. But then in this case, Cowell decided to accept that the other, when the other officer says, I am a gentleman, he demanded his, his address. He said, where do you live? So we can take, we can follow this up afterwards with an exchange of messages. And then he, he sort of conceded and said, actually, I'm sorry for pushing you because I didn't realize you were, uh, um, and, um, that the among the other officers that doesn't really play it very well because then they think well you offered an apology after the fact you've disgraced yourself because and you seem to have offered that apology because you were reluctant to duel but what's interesting is at the start the officers in the theater 
and, and later in the court martial, they're like, well, if you had said he wasn't a gentleman, if you had taken that stance, then it would have been fine. You could have pushed him around, whatever. But once you accepted he was a gentleman, then you had to sort of do, uh, 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 carry this out through the code of honor. Uh, and now you're later saying, well, I'm not even sure he was a gentleman, so maybe I shouldn't have, have, have dealt him as kind of your extenuating circumstance in the court martial. They're like, well, that's no good. You could have had him you know, removed by security at the time. But once you accept he's a gentleman, you have to treat him as a gentleman and you can't recede uh, uh, and or apologize and dishonor yourself uh, or try to claim that you know he wasn't a gentleman. So it doesn't matter uh, uh, how you conducted yourself. So there is a lot of st status ambiguity here um, uh, and at, at play. And sometimes that is invoked. Uh, to further insult people, uh, but most of the time these are these are affairs among uh, either gentlemen or those claiming genteel status. Right, it's it's very multi-layered, and and perhaps another layer. Um, I think we'll just if it's okay, we'll just do one more question before we. Um, so, during the Napoleonic Wars, of course, um, the officers' class wasn't exclusively gentlemen. No. Um, it just wasn't possible, and so I think. Um, 10% or more of these officers would have been risen from the ranks. Did that have a, an effect on, yeah. on this sort of social standing and and notion of honor? It had a massive uh, impact. And um, uh, there was a lot of contemporary uh, recognition of this sort of uh, uh, social diversification of the officer corps. Uh, and I think most contemporaries who were uh, uh, discussing this uh, saw it in a critical view. They probably call it the dilution, the social dilution of the officer corps, where you have people with uh, less claim to genteel status uh, um, being able to apply and receive commissions. And remember, many most commissions in, in, mil in wartime are actually being offered for free because the army is pretty much desperate uh, uh, to find uh, anyone uh, 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 of some genteel standing with some uh, ability to read or write uh, who can get an, a recommendation to, to, to enter the, the, the military um, because they, the, the attrition rates, the expansion of the army requires uh, uh, the manpower and they just can't fill the places fat quickly enough. And there's a lot of recognition that uh, sort of men of, of low, low manners or, or little education are being uh, allowed to join. There are cases where uh, uh, men will uh, uh, join as officers and they can't read and write. So they're having to be discreetly uh, uh, sent to uh, uh, study under the schoolmaster sergeant. Um, there was a lot of complaining and uh, much of this obviously we can see through a lens of, of class prejudice, uh, but I think there's a genuine point here in that it does seem to be undermining the social cohesion of the officer corps in that there were men from uh, a greater variety of backgrounds coming in. Um, there was a lot of complaint among British, uh, English and Scottish officers uh, of Irish officers, particularly those from the west of Ireland, uh, who they thought were uh, had had very brusque manners. They didn't have the refined manners that uh, uh, officers were expected to to embody. And they were also too keen on dueling. They were too trigger happy. And so you have this kind of while dueling was seen as really important to the the culture of honor and a necessary kind of a necessary evil as a backstop to prevent people from just shooting their mouth off and insulting people without really meaning it. Um, there was also a sense that, okay, well, you know, dealing is necessary, but we shouldn't just have, you know, random violence all the time. We should try to rationalize this. So it's only hopefully one shot uh, each in a duel. People should be standing apart and sideways so that there's less risk of, 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 uh, of death. So we're trying to minimize the damage here while also having this useful social institution, the duel. And there was a feeling that Irish officers, that these sort of, these Irish officers from a, a sort of lower social background were being now allowed into the army and they were just sort of challenging people willy nilly. And that was defeating the, the purpose of the duel as kind of this last resort, a very useful last resort, and now just pissing everyone off and degrading mess room uh, uh, um, uh, camaraderie. And so there's a lot of people who say that, uh, many officers write about that in, in, the, in their memoirs. Um, about a sense that the officer corps was was changing, and that then not not everyone had the same shared social backgrounds and social norms, um, and we can think about duels as well as courts martial as a way of officers uh, collectively trying to enforce norms of of honor, politeness, and gentility on uh, their messmates and those who you know are seen as uncouth can be blacklisted, can be ostracized until they kind of sh they they shape up, and so in some ways this is while the army is expanding, uh, the the officer corps is expanding and diversifying. Uh, these kind of tools that we talk about, that we're talking about today, dueling, course martial, social ostracism, uh, are, these, are, these are collective, these are ways for officers collectively to kind of police behavior um, and to try to, inf to ensure that newcomers uh, uh, be, uh, behave. And often newcomers, uh, if they didn't, if they didn't uh, uh, get along with the officers would try to transfer to a different corps, they would resign their commission. And these would, uh, officers would deliberately ostracize men who they didn't appreciate or didn't feel were upholding the expected standards of behavior as a way to force them out.
and in many cases that was effectively legitimized harassment and bullying. We shouldn't, you know, say that uh, was a, it, it was in many ways a more efficient way of doing things than courts martial, which were time consuming and required evidence. Uh, whereas, you know, men could be ostracized without due process and made to suffer immensely. But it was also a way from officers to relatively easily police behavior and and ensure that the the values that they thought were important. Uh, uh, were being were being upheld, and there's an. Uh, if I can add one more thing, there's a in Jam there's a great piece of evidence I found in from Jamaica where the major general he's he's talking about in a, in a submission back to London about some courts martial. He says, you know, the st the standard of the lowering standards of of officers that we've been accepting is causing all these courts martial. This is, he thought it was the reason that there's all this discord, uh, personal strife that is that is leading to uh, time wasting uh, and and different and and uh, um, unnecessary courts martial because of this lack of shared social uh, uh, backgrounds that's causing tension. So again, much of that is probably class prejudice, but I think there's an element of, 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 of genuine uh, sense that because officers were now coming from a, an increasing range of backgrounds, they didn't necessarily have the same uh, gentility or commitment to this, this, the, this elite culture and the same schooling and background, that did cause problems uh, in the mess room. And that was often uh, remarked on uh, at the time. Fantastic. Thank you. I'm just going to talk for about five seconds, allow you to grab a quick drink of water before you continue. Um, and I'll just mention that uh, Eamon's going to continue in, uh, in just a few seconds here. But um, if we didn't get to your question this time, uh, I'll try to bring it forward um, in a few minutes and we'll do our best to get everybody's questions answered. Thanks, Eamon. Back to you. Okay. Well, thanks very much, uh, Chris. Um, now, so as I mentioned, courts martial were becoming uh, an increasingly accepted avenue for prosecuting slights uh, against the honor of military men. But at the same time, junior officers uh, who were insulted by their superiors uh, could face social pressure to demand satisfaction uh, under the honor code. So in 1819 at Cape Town, for instance, in what's now uh, South Africa, Captain Hussey of the 38th foot called Lieutenant Osborne, quote, a damn scoundrel, a rascal, a blackguard, and a coward at mess. Uh, prompting Osborne to throw wine in his face. Now, the general opinion of the regiment reckoned, quote, there was but one way of settling it. Uh, with no apology forthcoming, Lieutenant Osborne challenged his superior officer, killing him in the resulting duel. Osborne and both seconds were court-martialed but acquitted, a result uh, which elicited, elicited universal joy uh, in the Corps. Captain Fuchs of the Royal Regiment was twice challenged by his subordinate, Lieutenant Sonnenberg, uh, who was also the nephew of the commanding officer, in 1809. And he was ostracized by his messmates after failing to appear at the second rencontre uh, due to his ability to find a second. Uh, and to add one more example, Colonel Aston of the 12th Foot, he accepted challenges from both Major Picton and Brevet Major Allen, his immediate subordinates in India uh, in 1798. And he was mortally wounded in the latter duel. So clearly, it wasn't unheard of uh, for subordinates to challenge superiors to fight a duel. But army authorities, cognizant of the need to safeguard hierarchical obedience, frowned on the practice. Military men who called out their superiors were playing a dangerous game because they were much more likely to face prosecution under the army's selectively enforced anti-dueling laws than those who challenged messmates of equal or lesser rank. Quartermaster William Surtees of the 95th Rifles considered calling out a superior officer, uh, a senior officer in the peninsula, uh, who had set loose Surtees' horses and mules to stable his own in their place. But he ultimately demurred due to the risk of court martial and dismissal. Having consulted with colleagues, uh, Surtees wrote, it was feared the offender might take advantage of his superior rank, not only to decline giving me that satisfaction, but to report me for an insubordinate challenge and thus destroy my prospects for life. When Lieutenant Lawrence of the 14th Foot called out his commanding officer, Captain Strand, aboard a transport ship in 1795, Strand refused to accept and arrested him instead. Lawrence resigned to avoid courts martial. One Catholic officer of the 40th Foot survived 12 peninsular battles, receiving two wounds, but he was compelled to leave the army because after, quote, a very gross provocation on the score of his religion, he had challenged a senior officer to fight a duel. Yet outcomes for subordinates who demanded satisfaction from superiors varied even within the same corps. John Radford 
a lieutenant in the fractious 1st Battalion 62nd Foot serving in Sicily, described the case of a newly arrived officer who insulted a subordinate at mess. The affronted gentleman, very properly in Radford's words, called him out and wounded the obnoxious offender through both thighs. Shots were also exchanged after Captain Roberts reproached Captain Crookshanks for improper conduct at the 1st Battalion 62nd's mess. But the wily Roberts then turned to military law to accomplish what his marksmanship could not. As senior captain, Roberts contended after the fact that Crookshanks' challenge had been insubordinate, forcing his adversary to leave the army altogether to avoid charges, while Crookshanks' second was court-martialed and cashiered for merely, in Radford's words, carrying the hostile message from a junior to a senior officer. Although Radford clearly considered calling out superiors a pardonable offense, military authorities who were tasked with maintaining discipline were obliged to take a stricter view. Now, affronted subordinates sometimes attempted to reconcile the competing demands of honor uh, and military law by using the conditional tense, announcing their intention to challenge their commanders if and when they were liberated from the strictures of subordination. So to choose a relevant example uh, 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 for the symposium, Captain Gordon of the 1st Battalion, 1st Foot, the Royal Scots, he sent a taunting note to his commanding officer in, on the 25th of December, 1812 in Canada, sarcastically styled a Christmas gift, suggesting he would have taken, quote, serious private notice of the major's unhandsome behavior if rank had not ruled out a duel. Now, Gordon soon regretted his note and tried to recant, but he was prosecuted and suspended from rank and pay for six months. A year and a half later, in the same battalion at Queenston in Upper Canada, the quick-tempered Captain Brereton threatened to call out Captain Bird, temporarily in charge as senior captain, once a field officer returned and resumed command. But this didn't work. Brereton spent 23 days under arrest for insubordination and was obliged to make an ample apology. Now, some subalterns believed that pursuing quarrels with former superiors was permissible once they had left full-time service and were therefore no longer subject to their authority. Ensign Purefoy, court-martialed and dismissed from the army for misconduct, doggedly pursued vengeance against his erstwhile commanding officer as a civilian, finally provoking Colonel Roper into a duel and killing him in 1788. At the ensuing civil trial, the prosecution warned that lenience would undermine, quote, all idea of due discipline and subordination in the army. But the disgraced subaltern claimed, quote, the tyranny of custom had obliged him to vindicate his honor through personal combat, and he was duly acquitted by a sympathetic jury. In 1813, the quarrelsome Lieutenant Blake of the 55th Foot avenged himself on his nemesis, Captain Clune first by telling Clune to kiss my arse after parade, and then caning him in the streets of Windsor. Now in the ensuing court martial, Blake claimed to be guiltless of striking his superior officer because he had tendered his resignation from the army immediately beforehand and had therefore been acting as a private gentleman at the time of the assault. Blake brazenly framed his conduct as demonstrating deep respect for army law rather than contempt for its strictures. Faced with the conflicting demands of army hierarchy and honor culture, Blake contended that he had resigned to avoid breaching the Articles of War, therefore sacrificing his military career to attend to, quote, the more imperative duty of upholding my honor, namely thrashing Captain Clune in the street with cl a clear conscience. Now, unsurprisingly, this line of argument did not prevent Blake's cashiering, his, uh, uh, the removal the, uh, uh, of his commission, uh, because the court held that any resignation required acceptance uh, before an officer was released from all of his military obligations. Uh, but the notion that departure from full-time service signaled basically open season against former commanders, this continued to enjoy purchase in the regiment. Two subalterns of the 55th foot placed on the half pay in 1819 sent challenges to their erstwhile commanding officer, the long suffering Lieutenant Colonel Frederick. Both men were consequently struck from the army lists with the Prince Regent 
warning officers that half pay status didn't just give them free reign to demand satisfaction from former superiors. Now, it's difficult to avoid the impression that officers like Lieutenant Blake were acting in bad faith because, but on the other hand, the competing demands of military hierarchy and gentlemanly equality clearly did place military men in perilous straits. As Captain Roberts of the 62nd foot pointed out at his own court martial for mess room insubordination, an officer who considered himself insulted by a superior faced an unappealing paradox. If he meekly ignored the offense, he risked being ostracized by his comrades as a coward. But if he demanded satisfaction from his commanding officer, he risked court martial and dismissal instead. The predicament of Lieutenant Sullivan of the lifeguards encapsulates the fraught position of aggrieved subordinates. Sullivan requested an explanation after being publicly insulted by his commanding officer, Major Kamak, only for the major to encourage him to disregard rank and issue a challenge. But Sullivan suspected duplicity and declined, fearing that Kamak would go back on his word and court-martial him for insubordination. When Kamak implied that the lieutenant was afraid to call him out, Sullivan, wary of being labeled a coward, vowed to fight in five minutes if the major would repeat his invitation to duel before a third party, basically a witness who could say he gave me permission to challenge him to fight uh, a duel. But Kamak refused this and no shots were exchanged. Sullivan's cautious response in this case had allowed him to safeguard his reputation while avoiding legal exposure. Now, commanding officers who quarreled with their juniors also faced at times social pressure to conform to honor culture. Now, many were prepared to use their powers under the Articles of War to arrest and court-martial offensive subordinates, but others fought duels out of concern that an attempt to invoke army law or hierarchy might be construed as cowardice. So Major Chapman of the 18th Foot admitted he had erred in agreeing to exchange shots in, with Captain Delancey, a perennially vexatious subordinate at Gibraltar in 1788. But Chapman explained that he had felt compelled to accept the challenge in accordance with the laws of honor, lest he allow Delancey and his sympathizers to quote, whisper away my reputation by injurious insinuations respecting my want of courage. Tension between military subordination and the culture of honor can also be glimpsed in the court-martial of five captains of the first Somerset militia, charged with conspiring to ostracize both of their majors, one of whom was the commanding officer, for failing to duel after an 1809 quarrel. Now, junior officers, of course, regularly faced social exile for neglecting to avenge insults with a challenge to duel. But shunning superiors was another matter entirely. Given the threat to military discipline, all five captains were sentenced to dismissal. Contradictions between military hierarchy and honor culture in some caused uncertainty over the propriety of subordinates challenging superiors. Similar ambiguities can be glimpsed in the conceptions of the mess a convivial shared space where officers ate, drank, and conversed on a daily basis. Communal messing was central to the regimental system, promoting fraternal bo bonding and esprit de corps. Thomas St. Clair, recalling his, his salad days as a subaltern in the Royal Scots, praised the mess for fostering, quote, an agreeable society in which, generally speaking, harmony and good fellowship prevail. Mess room culture encouraged the most sincere friendships, as he put it, among officers, providing the cohesion necessary for battlefield success. Crucially, the mess served as a social leveler, temporarily suppressing hierarchical distinctions and encouraging officers to interact as fellow gentlemen. Rank is nothing at mess, St. Clair claimed. Even field officers risked being humbled by the, quote, quick repartee and roasting of their juniors over dinner. The mess room status as an egalitarian space was reinforced by the nature of its organization. All officers, uh, officers of all ranks took turns serving as the mess president and all members were subject to its rules regardless of seniority. 
Ralph Heathcote, who reported to his mother uh, uh, on joining the first uh, Royal Dragoons in 1806 that, quote, every officer is perfectly equal, except on parade, described the enforcement of mess regulations in his regiment. Yesterday, Captain Wyndham came down five minutes too late to dinner after the other officers uh, uh, of the mess had sat down. The president of the day, a lowly cornet, uh, fined Wyndham one bottle of wine for this offense. So much for subordination, wrote Heathcote. Notably, military men frequently described their messmates in familial terms, habitually referring to peers as brother officers. Lieutenant John Le Couture of the 104th Foot fondly recalled his regiment's, quote, happy mess of brotherhood, while William Hay remembered living as, quote, a child in a happy and well-conducted family as an 18-year-old ensign. Such talk of kinship, proof of the camaraderie promoted by the regimental system, could sometimes reinforce military hierarchy, as evidenced by manifold references to commanding officers as the fathers of their corps. But the fraternal egalitarianism nurtured at mess also threatened martial expectations of hierarchical obedience. While junior officers accepted subordination on the parade square, many shared St. Clair's view that rank was laid aside around the mess table. But commanding officers and army authorities disagreed with this. The military writer Charles James condemned the prevalent but quote, very erroneous notion that officers were released from professional responsibility and obedience over dinner, citing a court martial judgment by the Prince Regent proclaiming, quote, gentlemanly deference to commanding officers as, as essential to a well-regulated mess. As Lieutenant Colonel Proctor of the 41st Foot was obliged to remind his subordinates at Fort George in Upper Canada in 1808, disrespect to the commanding officer was as culpable at mess as, quote, it would be on a parade or in any other situation. Now, the 1816 court martial of Lieutenant Frederick Wood of the 11th Light Dragoons in France elucidates these conflicting expectations of mess room behavior. Lieutenant Colonel Slay heard Wood confess over dinner that he had yet to procure the new Shaco ornament that Slay had mandated only days before the stipulated deadline for the officers to acquire and then begin wearing them. The indignant commanding officer exchanged warm words with Wood, demanding the lieutenant, quote, hold his tongue and obtain the ornament immediately. Now, Wood queried whether Slay was speaking as Mr. Slay, a fellow gentleman at mess, or as his commanding officer, a question which was deemed reasonable enough by others present, but which Slay considered an attack on his authority. The Lieutenant Colonel replied that he was Wood's commanding officer at mess, just as in the field, again demanding silence, claiming he had never before been held, ordered to hold his tongue at mess during his 15 year military career, Wood vowed never to dine there again in future. The next day, Wood lost command of his troop, a decision that Slay argued had been a long time coming due to Wood's mismanagement, but which the Lieutenant understandably considered retaliation for their mess room altercation. Wood burst into Slay's quarters and became, quote, very violent, shaking his fist, calling Slay a coward and threatening to blow his brains out. Proclaiming himself a gentleman's son who refused to be trampled on, Wood demanded a duel. The Lieutenant Colonel court-martialed Wood instead, both for denying his authority at mess and for his extraordinary tirade of insults and threats. But the court clearly sympathized with the defendant, while the officers who witnessed the mess room altercation denied that Wood had behaved disrespectfully. Acquitted of contradicting Slay's authority and found only partly guilty of insulting and challenging the Lieutenant Colonel, Wood was sentenced to a severe reprimand and the loss of regimental seniority. This relative leniency, considering the offense, and the court's uh, indiff evident indifference towards mess room insubordination proved unacceptable to the Duke of Wellington, the Duke of York, then commander in chief of the army, uh, and the Prince Regent. The Prince Regent himself ordered the court to revise its findings. Bowing to pressure, the court canceled their initial sentence. 
convicting Wood on all charges and advising the cashiering, the loss of his commission. Now, conflicting interpretations of mess room authority also lay behind a revealing 1818 dispute between Major Pete and his subordinates of the 25th foot on Barbados. The officers carried out uh, um, carried a motion uh, to reschedule their daily mess dinners, but Pete refused to countenance a later start, informing his subordinates, quote, they might vote what they liked, but the hour should not be changed. Several officers quit the mess and contemplated forming their own private dining club to escape Pete's jurisdiction. While the embattled major court-martialed his second in command, Brevet Major Bailey, for failing to publicly support him. In the resulting judgment, the Prince Regent reaffirmed the commanding officer's authority over the regimental mess, including his right to regulate the time of dining. But he also criticized Pete for failing to more robustly assert his position, rather than firmly ordering the rebels to return to mess at the customary hour, the major had allowed the schism to continue for months, further undermining his authority by quote a weak attempt to enforce it through half measures. Lieutenant Colonel Cod of the 60th Foot, commanding on Barbados, had attempted to advise Pete during this crisis by recounting his own rather sterner handling of a similar mess room insurrection. When his officers had once voted to change the hour of mess without his prior approval, Cod ordered the mess man to lay the table at the new time, but then forced the insubordinate officers to remain on parade while inviting those who had opposed the change to dine with him in the mess. After enjoying his meal, Cod returned to the parade square and dismissed the, the dissenters, sending, the, sending them to quarters with empty stomachs. This standoff continued for three or four days until the rebels conceded defeat. Cod had therefore leveraged his ascendancy on the parade square, which no officer could reasonably question, to effectively starve his subordinates into accepting his authority in the more contested confines of the mess. But despite these repeated efforts by individual commanders and military authorities to enforce mess room subordination, junior officers clung to this vision of the mess as a space of egalitarian comradeship, free from hierarchical trammels. As Coldstream ensign John Mills professed in an 1812 letter to his father, quote, at the mess table, the commanding officer is upon a par with the others. And any assumption of authority there is always looked upon with the greatest jealousy by his juniors. Superior officers in his view had no right to order around messmates over dinner. Okay, so we have a second question period. There'll be more time for question at the end, but I thought I'd give you, uh, Chris, a chance to uh, uh, hit me with a few now that we've wrapped up the section on mess room authority. Thank you. I'm just, uh, I'm a little conscious of the time, so I'm just gonna do one for now, if that's all right. Um, yeah. A quick one, and then uh, maybe we'll get some more uh, at the end. Um, yeah. So, uh, we had a question about uh, the Royal Navy and wondering if the um, these same uh, high, hierarchies and, and dichotomies um, played out in the in the Royal Navy as well as the the uh, the army. That's a great question. I'm afraid I don't really know the answer uh, because I haven't looked into it uh, from the naval side, and I'm not aware of much uh, research and scholarship on that. I could be wrong. Uh, uh, on the naval side of these kind of these these sort of mess uh, uh, room uh, uh, quarrels and sort of debates over 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 hierarchy, I would as expect they did exist, but I'm afraid at this stage I've only looked at the uh, at the army, including the regulars, militia, and to some extent the volunteers, other part-time forces. I'm afraid I haven't looked at the navy, so I I really can't uh, speak to that question. But it's a really good one and something I'd like to explore uh, in future. Fantastic. Okay, so I am going to um, just ask if we can keep going, and I'll just tell everybody else that yeah. um, I think we're um, nearing the end of the presentation, so we'll right. get to the rest of the questions at the end, if that's all right. This is the, the final third now. Right, so tensions between a military hierarchy and fraternal egalitarianism, uh, which we've discussed throughout the, the paper, they were also manifested in the decision-making process of courts martial and collective mass meetings. Military tribunals mirroring civilian juries granted all impaneled officers equal say 
when reaching verdicts by majority vote. Indeed, the judicial system was explicitly designed to ensure equal input from all officers, from all ranks, uh, with officers offering opinion in the reverse order of seniority during deliberations to prevent junior members from being influenced unduly by the views of superiors. This procedure was mirrored in regimental mess meetings, which were often used to police peer conduct and impose collective ostracism on misbehaving brother officers, sending them to Coventry in contemporary parlance. All attendees at these quasi-judicial assemblies, which effectively functioned as internal courts of honor, were entitled to one vote, regardless of rank, again with the most junior members speaking first during deliberations. Although commanding officers occupied bully pulpits and typically managed to secure decisions in line with their own opinion, the egalitarian structure of mess meetings enabled subordinates to overrule superiors through the weight of numbers, subverting military hierarchy. Hoping to force the imperious Captain McLean to quit the 10th Royal Veteran Battalion at Quebec in 1808, for example, Lieutenant Colonel Zouche seized upon a letter in which McLean had accused brother officers of forfeiting the respect of both common soldiers and of genteel society by associating with, quote, low company. Zouche convened a meeting, urging his subordinates to shun the captain for de denigrating, as he put it, the whole of the officers. Although attendees were irritated and hurt on first hearing of Zouche's allegations, they grew calmer on rereading the letter and realizing that it only referred to some officers, not the entire mess, a caveat that Zouche had conveniently uh, obscured. They stopped short of ostracizing the author, despite Zouche's wishes. Stymied by his subordinates, Zouche was obliged to court-martial McLean instead. To give another example, in 1805, Lieutenant Hazlitt of the Donegal Militia complained about Lieutenant Nesbitt's unwarrantable conduct, prompting a court of inquiry which recommended that Nesbitt apologize. Yet Hazlitt felt that the time for reconciliation had by then passed and, success, uh, and unsuccessfully petitioned for a court-martial to investigate, while the officers collectively resolved to expel Nesbitt from the mess. Lord Leitrim, the colonel of the Donegal militia, wrote to his subordinates to express disapproval of this course. As Nesbitt had offered to beg pardon for his offense, it was unreasonable to ostracize him at this stage simply because Hazlitt refused to accept an, an apology. Although Leitrim framed his comments, quote, merely as friendly advice, he also sternly informed the officers that their decision to escalate the quarrel by shunning Nesbitt after the commander of the forces had already endorsed an amicable se settlement was, quote, improper and unmilitary. But Leitrim's letter failed to shift opinion. The officers resolved to continue Nesbitt's ostracism, collectively asserting their right to regulate messroom life as they saw fit. More seriously, the 55th foot twice defied their commanding officer at mess meetings while stationed in Jamaica. In 1808, newly appointed Lieutenant Colonel Smith took exception to his, subordinate, his subordinate's dislike of Captain Kloon, publicizing his belief that the much despised officer deserved another chance. However, at a meeting convened by Smith to settle mess accounts, Major Heiliger moved to ostracize Kloon and another officer for past misbehavior. Exasperated by such wanton defiance of his wishes, Smith walked out of the room, proclaiming he wanted, quote, nothing to do with the motion, which was carried anyway in his absence. Four years later, after learning that Lieutenant Blake had insulted his own regiment by calling the 55th foot a, quote, rascally corps, Major Frederick convened a mess meeting to urge his subordinates to treat Blake with silent contempt. Although Captain Clune believed that Blake deserved ostracism for his comments, the other six officers present in Jamaica, all lieutenants, they dissented, arguing the offense had occurred months earlier and that Blake had already apologized. Major Frederick considered this repudiation a betrayal, bitter, bitterly threatening to report the proceedings to the regiment's colonel in England, quote, to show him how far I have been supported by the officers under my command. Yet the lieutenants, were unmoved, believing themselves entitled to overrule their commanding officer at corporate mess meetings, where army custom gave all ranks equal say in decision-making. So conflicts between the notion of military hierarchy and gentlemanly equality uh, can also be glimpsed in courts martial proceedings. 
Although Lieutenant Wood's jury folded under royal pressure, junior officers occasionally asserted their right to stand by verdicts in defiance of superiors. Major Vaughn Morell of the 30th Foot, eager to rid himself of the perennially troublesome Lieutenant Nicholson uh, in India in 1809, agreed to withdraw court-martial charges if Nicholson returned home and quietly exchanged corps. And this is a quite common sort of informal, we'll court-martial you if you don't agree to leave quietly type of solution that regimental officers uh, uh, would undertake. Now, this pact was discussed and amended by the regiment's officers at a mass meeting. But Nicholson later had second thoughts and refused to resign. He was accordingly court-martialed, both for going back on his word and for urging the repetition of a duel between two captains of the regiment a year before. Nicholson behaved truculently at trial, accusing Vaumorel and others of conspiring to oppress him with unfair dealings, while offering conflicting and rather unpersuasive explanations for his refusal to sign uh, the agreement. Yet the court clearly sided with the defendant, acquitting Nicholson of reneging on the pact and sentencing him to a mere reprimand for predicting blood must be spilt in a regimental feud. Colonel Wilkinson, the, re the relevant commander of the forces, took issue with the court's reasoning, asking them to reconsider as he was legally entitled to do. Now, there was certainly no love lost between Wilkinson and Nicholson. The former had made no effort to deny that he once had declared Nicholson deserved to be hanged for inflaming regimental quarrels. But the 15 members of Nicholson's court martial, 10 of whom were subalterns, refused to alter their verdict, overriding Wilkinson's objection. Although we can't know the court's in-camera reasoning, it seems most likely that what commanders perceived as a story of a mischief-making sub subordinate, subalterns considered a case of a commanding officer attempting to bully and railroad a lieutenant into quitting the corps, and perhaps they sympathized with his plight. Whether or not Nicholson deserved this leniency, a supermajority of subalterns, exercising their prerogative under military law, defied the wishes of superiors, saddling Vaumorel with the recalc recalcitrant lieutenant for several more years. A fatal 1811 Peninsula duel produced another example of independent-minded jurisprudence. Although the evidence against Captain Patterson of the 77th foot was unusually strong, he was acquitted of murdering Captain Lewis by a sympathetic jury. Lord Wellington demanded a revision, perhaps hoping to discourage dueling in his army by making an example of the case. Yet the court-martial panel, noting that Lewis in his dying words had blamed only himself for his fate, refused to reconsider, overruling Wellington and asserting the primacy of the honor code over military law. Finally, uh, as the junior member of an 1812 court martial trying a soldier for intoxication on duty, Lieutenant John Lecouture uh, proposed leniency, contending that the man had been guilty of simple drunkenness only because he hadn't been given sufficient warning to sober up before being summoned for guard. The two other most junior officers on the court martial concurred with Lecouture's reasoning outvoting the captain and the senior subaltern, who both maintained that the soldier deserved harsher punishment. Lieutenant General Taylor, also convinced the offense merited stiffer penalties, ordered the court-martial to reconvene, but Lecouture reiterated his rationale for leniency. Although the captain was, to quote Lecouture, indiscreet in his reproofs to us during deliberations, Lecouture and his two allies upheld the initial judgment by majority vote three to two. Forced to accept the verdict, Taylor churlishly issued a severe censure on the three subalterns for an ill-judged sentence. While the 17-year-old Lecouture was complimented by many old officers for his stance and recounts this in his, in, in his memoirs, uh, the Lieutenant General took revenge by assigning him the undesirable task of supervising a detachment of wounded soldiers. Flouting one's superiors in this manner undeniably required gumption, determination, and self-assurance. And it is worth emphasizing that such refusals to revise court-martial judgments when requested appear to have been occasional rather than commonplace. But the striking fact remains that the egalitarian decision-making structure of both mess meetings and courts martial enabled junior officers at times to override the ordinary imperatives of military hierarchy. So to conclude, British army officers during the era of the War of 1812 clearly shared a set of core values encompassing honor, courage, 
gentility, and brotherly conviviality. And they scorned messmates who failed to embody these ideals. Dueling, social ostracism, and courts martial should all be seen as mechanisms through which officers collectively enforced and inculcated normative expectations of honorable and polite conduct. But by exploring ambiguities surrounding mess room subordination and the propriety of challenging superior officers, I've sought to highlight points of tension between the prevailing culture of honor and that of martial discipline. The contradictions between these behavioral codes forced officers, especially those considering themselves insulted by superiors, into unpleasant quandaries as they sought to reconcile military demands for absolute obedience with the need to vindicate their personal honor through dueling. Civilian notions of masculine autonomy, honor culture's insistence on gentlemanly equality, and the fraternal egalitarianism fostered at mess all challenged the army's insistence on hierarchical authority, fueling tension and conflict within regimental families. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Officers' perspectives depended on their rank. Commanders insisted on total obedience, while their juniors more often articulated a vision of regimental society, emphasizing brotherhood over subordination, defending the mess as a space of gentlemanly equality, free from hierarchical trammels. So as we've seen as well, officers periodically asserted their collective power at mess meetings and courts martial where the one member, one vote decision-making process allowed subalterns to overrule their seniors. Although commanders generally expected subordinates to heed their wishes, junior officers sometimes exercised their prerogative to make judgments in explicit defiance of superiors. Historians, including Nick Mansfield and Peter Way, have highlighted the existence of a military contract culture and a moral economy among the rank and file wherein soldiers bargained collectively with their commanders and insisted on customary rights. And I'd suggest that this analysis should be extended to junior officers as well, because as, as we've seen today, they too negotiated the boundaries of military authority and fought to preserve their mess room privileges. Indeed, for all the talk of the forgotten War of 1812 or Napoleonic era for common soldier, we arguably know even less about the collective experience of the subaltern ranks despite the wealth of autobiographical material available. Although several able regimental histories and the recent doctoral research of David Huff have considerably enhanced our understanding of the backgrounds, the lives and the outlooks of junior officers, much more remains to be explored. But I hope that this paper has helped rescue in some small way the agency of army subalterns by regarding them not simply as subservient peons or cogs in the machine of the fiscal military state, but as actors who are keen to impose limits on their own subordination, to assert their collective power, and to stake their claims to status, both as independent gentlemen and men of honor. Cheers. Thanks. Um, thanks, thanks, Eamon. I, I'm sure that uh, Tom's gonna jump in in a minute with, um, with his thank yous as well. But uh, before we get to that, uh, or before he gets to that, th this is a fascinating topic. So thank you very much for bringing that uh, to light a little bit for us, uh, trying to wade through some of those layers. Um, I should have mentioned at the beginning, or perhaps put it on the chat, uh, there is a delay between um, the live feed on Zoom and um, and seeing it on YouTube. So that's why sometimes we had uh, people posting questions about the mess, but I wasn't seeing them until after uh, you started your third topic. So if you don't mind, if I could jump back to a couple okay. mess questions. Yeah. Um, so one is uh, simply, why was the hour, uh, the dining hour so contentious? Why why would that come up so often? Um, I think it was a, it seems to be a personal a choice issue with the, with the officers in question as to what time was convenient for them with their other duties and uh, their obligations uh, and their recreational uh, activities in, in, in the instances. Uh, I don't think there's much explained in the particular case of the 25th as to the reasoning, if I recall. Um, I'm not sure how contentious it was to across the army. Um, I cited, you know, the two cases there, both happening in Barbados, which maybe does suggest there's a little bit of a trend. Um, but I think what's what's interesting there is, uh, and why I honed in on those case studies, 
is because it shows uh, uh, that that uh, uh, tension between uh, and and that ambiguity over who actually has say over the running of the mess, uh, and. Uh, the the, off, the commanding officers in that question uh, uh, in both the instances, and then ultimately the Prince Regent when he weighed in on the the issue in the twenty fifth uh, uh, foot after the court martial judgment, uh, reiterated the fact that the the commanding officer has total has has ultimate authority, and if he doesn't want the mess a time change, the officers can't just get together and vote on things and just decide collectively. We'd rather be more convenient if it was earlier in the day or later, um, but. Clearly, the, the 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 junior officers, what this, these examples show, uh, often thought of, of the mess as something while, OK, the, the commanding officer has total authority on the parade square when we're on duty. But in the mess, we're all basically equal gentlemen, and we all get to govern the mess uh, uh, according to uh, uh, basically a one member, one vote, sort of equal egalitarian structure. And that is reinforced in ways by the nature of how the mess uh, uh, was uh, 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 set up as, as I mentioned uh, in the presentation, where basically the rules were meant to be um, um, observed by all members of the mess, anyone who is who is uh, in attendance, uh, and the the presidency and vice presidency they would be rotated basically between officers, including the most junior officers who could basically, if they were if a, if a, if a, an ensign was uh, the president that night, they could fine uh, uh, captains uh, for a bottle of wine. Now the, the the one thing about this that should also be said is often more senior officers, those that had family, so field officers, especially you know lieutenant colonels, they wouldn't necessarily go to the mess every night. Um, um, so they, they would attend occasionally, but not always. Uh, but when they were in the mess, they were expected, uh, as well as captains were expected, uh, to, to obey the strictures of the, the uh, uh, mess regulations and obey the, the uh, decisions made by uh, the, the mess president. So there's this sort of egalitarian structure. And one thing I would be, I'm interested in is wondering how far that relates to uh, uh, gentlemen's clubs and other similar sort of social institutions in the 18th century and how much the mess and as, as I suspect it is, is a product of basically, you know, that kind of milieu. Uh, it, so if a gentleman's club is based on, on, on this kind of uh, uh, shared sense of, of, of self-governance, everyone has a say, maybe the mess is, 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 is modeled on that kind of, on those kind of lines. And that's the officers bring their understanding of what a, dr a, dr a drinking society or dining society is like in the civilian world into the, into the army. And that helps shape the way this is uh, the way this is structured. So, I mean, the mess issue, timing seems to be an issue at, at, on a number of occasions. Uh, and I think it's a really good case study. I'm not sure if it was, you know, the, uh, every regiment was having that particular issue, but what, what I think is quite clear, both in those instances and the others that I've given throughout the presentation is there's quite a lot of tension between uh, and, and uh, dispute over who actually has power in the mess, whether the commanding officer's authority is, 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 this, is preserved uh, and uh, respect and deference, gentlemanly deference, as the French region calls it, is to be expected there. And, you know, that's a nice little way of squaring the circle, saying, you know, you, you, you need to be defer to them, but you can still be gentlemen at the same time. Um, or uh, uh, whether officers think, as many do and say in their memoirs and letters at the time, that actually we're all basically brothers and we can sort of, you know, uh, roast and, and make fun of each other at mess uh, and rank is laid aside. And uh, that's clearly a common view throughout the army. And then that, you know, when issues come up about the governance of mess and about, you know, talking back to a commanding officer at mess, the junior officers, like in the case of Lieutenant Wood, seem to think, well, it's not actually insubordinate if he's like, you know, are you just a fellow gentleman? You shouldn't reprimand me at mess. Don't tell me to hold my tongue. I mean, those types of things he can get away with on the parade square, the lieutenant colonel, uh, according to the other junior officers. But they think in the mess, you know, that's that's probably overstepping a line because he can't just order people to hold their tongue. He can't tell them to shut up because we're all we all deserve equal consideration here. And so that that sort of ambiguity, despite the efforts of the military authorities to say no, no, no command applies equally in the mess is constantly being contested. Uh, and the issue of, of mess room uh, timing, even though I only have a couple of examples of it, there could well be more. Uh, the challenge is we only find out about these things often if they're written about in memoirs, uh, which is quite rare, these types of like sort of petty disputes, you know, 40 years later um, is something that would, would come up or in, in courts martial where these things spiral uh, into, into massive uh, inflammatory disputes and well-documented trials. And that's where I've, I've gained those examples. Wouldn't be surprised if it happens more often, but unfortunately a lot of these internal regimental politics uh, are lost to us uh, because they, they aren't copiously documented as in the few cases uh, of courts martial where things really get out of hand. And then they start talking about all the you know, issues they've been having for years before. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah, and, and so it appears that it's, uh, Maybe it's not the it's sort of uh, the timing is the flashpoint rather than the, you know, we're not we're not so much concerned about the the timing of the mess, 
but this is something that we can debate our authority over. So it's become yeah. that focal point. It clearly um, speaks to the wider issue of, of, of who's in charge. And, and that's what right. I'm so revealing about these particular little squabbles over timing. Right. Thank you. Um, so um, the comments are rolling in. Fascinating topic. People on on um, on the YouTube comment are very, a lot of positive comments. So thank you very much. Um, just one other thing I wanted to highlight. Um, we did have somebody very early on in your talk um, asking to stay up to date on your your current research. So I, I wanted to point out that you put your Twitter handle there. Um, if anybody's on Twitter, um, you should follow Eamon to keep up to date on his research. And hopefully, um, getting Tom's attention, maybe we can have you back uh, when you uh, when you finally wrap up that PhD or, or feel that you're at a point where you can present it. I think that'd be another fascinating okay. topic. Um, One thing I'll just add, I have, I've li added a list of further reading, so we'll just put that on the YouTube slide. If anyone's interested in sort of more research on questions of dueling and courts martial, here are a number of interesting articles that uh, some of them are publicly accessible, some are maybe require subscriptions, but if you email me, I'd be happy to send you copies. Uh, so if, if people are interested in these topics and would like to read further, those are some useful starting points. Right, thank you. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Tom now, uh, but I'm going to um, say if we if we didn't get to your question, I apologize. Um, we do have to um, turn it over uh, for our next presentation, so we do have to um, cut them off at some point. But thank you very much, Eamon, and uh, I'll turn it over to Tom. Thanks, Chris, and thank you, Eamon. That, that was outstanding uh, looking at, at the feedback in, in the online chat. Very, very strong. Uh, you know, comments, uh, positive comments. Uh, 